the topic of how to protect our young vegetable gardens and flower gardens from, from invaders from the woods. Uh, John is um, the state director for the uh, Wildlife Services Program, which is part of the USDA Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. Mm -hmm. And he's originally from down south, mm -hmm. but has been working on uh, wildlife damage issues for about nine years. So he'll be a great resource. And please join me in welcoming John Forbes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, I'm not the one that brought the rain, just so you know that. <laughs> We've had this long string of beautiful weather, and this is not my fault, I promise. Um, has anybody ever heard of Wildlife Services before, the, the agency? Sure. Yeah? Okay. Um, we're not the Fish and Wildlife Service, we're a separate entity from them. And um, some of the other functions that we do um, within APHIS, the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, um, Veterinary Services is one of our sister agencies, and they do a lot with, with livestock producers. They do a lot with uh, chicken farmers, for example, maintaining the health of chicken farms. Um, they're involved with a lot of different disease issues. There's also plant protection and quarantine, which um, tries to keep invasive pests out of the United States. They used to be involved with uh, border situations, but after the Homeland Security Department was developed, um, they, uh, we lost some of our border folks to Homeland Security, but we still maintain a uh, very competent staff that um, still has some educational functions at borders. Uh, but then they also try to educate folks you know, to, to prevent from keeping insect pests and so forth from coming in. Uh, firewood is a big thing that they're working with right now. Um, so. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, now, I apologize if anybody was hoping to, to get an education or to learn about um, things that are uh, like uh, horticulture related, because I, I don't really, I'm not a horticulture trained person, so I can't really tell you what plants uh, might be deer resistant. Uh, somebody at Extension might be able to help you with that. But once you have a problem, uh, we would be a good resource for you to work with. <clears throat> the mission of Wildlife Services is to provide federal leadership in managing human and wildlife conflicts. So let's see what that looks like here. We've got, uh, we're involved with a lot of different things. Okay, we have three major operational functions and then we also have a research branch. Um, so we protect people, we protect agriculture, we protect wildlife and natural resources, and then we do a variety of uh, a different research. So let's go to the next one. So in protecting people, has anybody ever heard of a bird strike? On an aircraft, yeah. Have you ever heard of a bird strike before January of this year? Yeah. It's a big issue and it's uh, getting bigger all the time, even as we speak. Um, in 2004, I believe it was, the space shuttle struck a vulture. And you can imagine the, the potential catastrophe that could have caused. So NASA takes this very seriously. Wildlife Services works with over 750 different airports throughout the United States. Um, we're starting to work internationally, especially as it relates to um, Department of Defense and military air bases. <clears throat> so if you were this person right here in that seat, what would you think if, if your airplane engine blew up? It's a pretty scary proposition. An engine can only withstand um, an impact from about a four-pound animal. So, uh, you know, a, a dove or a starling or a robin, not a particularly big issue, but a Canada goose or a gull or some of our bigger bird species that are quite numerous, especially along the East Coast, um, can cause significant damage. Uh, we also work with some municipalities in Maine in protecting drinking water. There are, you know, I think there's about eight or ten drinking water sources in Maine that are not filtered. Um, they're just, they're treated, they're chemically treated, but they're not filtered before they end up in the treatment facility. So the EPA and the state have very strict guidelines on what type of water quality gets into the treatment facilities. Um, one, oops, could you get back one? Um, one of the, uh, the lakes here in Maine identified gulls as a cause for increases in fecal coliform bacteria. And they were in danger of losing their filtration waiver from EPA if they didn't manage this, this fecal coliform bacteria. So we went in and almost to the day, you can almost see the day we showed up and started harassing the gulls off the lake, the fecal coliform bacteria came back down, EPA's happy, the city's happy, because to install a filtration system could be up to a $40 million expense that the citizens would have to, uh, to incur. Um, protecting people. We do a lot with uh, property damage, um, 
mostly related to um, technical assistance. You have a raccoon in your bird feeder. We can talk you through that. Um, last year, we sponsored a meeting for a lot of the energy producers in the state um, and other utilities too, including cell phones, um, about how to manage ospreys on these utility structures. If you drive down the highways in Maine, you see osprey nests all over the, the wires, I mean all over the poles. Problem is, if one of those big sticks falls across two wires, then everybody from that point forward doesn't have electric. You know, and if you're Central Maine Power or Bangor Hydro or some of these other folks, that's, that's a serious expense. Um, and there's also certain dangers involved with that too, um, fires and, and that sort of thing. Um, so we worked with all these utility companies to try to explain to them what their rights and responsibilities were regarding ospreys, and um, it had a big impact. And so I think that the, the state or the, um, the utility companies are more effectively managing um, ospreys on their structures. We also work with Department of Highways and some of our big industrial forest landowners in the Northwoods to prevent road damage from beavers. Um, beavers are aquatic rodents and, and they're very plentiful in the state of Maine. And when they plug up a culvert, it's usually not a huge problem until you have a big rain event like we have today. Um, then there's the potential to, uh, to lose the road. Um, other things that aren't quite so obvious is that sometimes when water gets above the culvert and runs under the road, it can um, compromise the, uh, the surface of the road underneath, which is really critical. So we try to work with those folks to, to manage beavers. Um, of course, we work with the Department of Animal Fisheries and Wildlife do what they want to do with the beavers. Some beavers are lethally removed and some beavers are just relocated to a different place where they won't cause problems. We also work with a lot of wildlife disease issues. Um, chronic wasting disease, uh, bovine tuberculosis, there's numerous wildlife diseases that can impact livestock. Um, in the state of Maine, we've worked with the state and um, some of our other federal agencies on avian influenza surveillance, looking for highly pathogenic avian influenza. And then last year we sampled over 800 wild birds. And there were no cases of highly pathogenic avian influenza, but low pathogenic avian influenza is out there and, and most of the, the scientists that work with it knew it was there. But it can still have an impact on the poultry industry. Um, we also are part of a national rabies management program for raccoons. Um, the raccoon variant of rabies is thought to be the most virulent strain of rabies. There's, there's different strains of rabies that have evolved in different animals like gray fox and bat and so forth. Um, <clears throat> but the raccoon strain appears uh, a, a little supercharged and can work its way through the raccoon population rather quickly. It made it from West Virginia and Virginia in the 1970s to Maine by 1994. Um, prior to that time, other strains of rabies had been here, but not raccoon strain. So there was an oral vaccine that was developed that we distribute from airplanes to vaccinate raccoons against rabies. Last year, we did, or as, a, as a program, we distributed over 11 million of these baits from Maine to Florida. Since we're part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, of course, one of our main functions is protecting agriculture. Um, we work with dairy farmers to uh, manage bird problems, particularly starlings. Um, We've removed starlings from dairies, and the dairymen have seen an instant increase in their milk production um, from one to four pounds of milk per cow per day. And, you know, if you're milking 800 to 1,000 head a day, that's a significant uh, cost that those birds cost you. But we also work with, um, with producers on livestock protection issues um, related to sheep and goat production. Most of that work is done in the western United States, but there are sheep and goat farmers all over. Um, a lot of what we provide here in Maine is just technical assistance and things that, that folks can do with their herd to minimize uh, impact from predators. And one of the sort of evolving missions of ours, aside from wildlife diseases, is working to protect endangered species, for example, piping plovers. We work, there were only 22 nesting pairs of piping plovers in Maine last year. Um, they're federally threatened, they're not federally endangered. There's piping plover populations all throughout the east, but there's not a lot of them anywhere. Um, so in Maine, we work to try to reduce predation on nests. When you have low populations of birds or other animals like this, um, you get into a situation called a predator sink. That even minor pred um, predation on nests or even adults can produce long-term impacts to the population. Um, so we, we work with some different groups to try to, um, to remove some of these predators to give these birds a chance. 
Um, invasive species are also another big issue. In Guam, for example, we work um, to try to keep the brown tree snake on the island of Guam and keep it from going to other islands because what they've seen is a drastic decline in the diversity and the number of birds on the islands of Guam because of these brown tree snakes. Uh, and then we have um, our National Wildlife Research Center. The primary office is located in Fort Collins, Colorado. But we have field stations all over the country that specialize in different areas. Our, our field station in Sandusky, Ohio, specializes in airport issues, for example. Um, we have a bird group in the state of Florida. So we get involved with a variety of different research. One that I find extremely interesting is managing for earthworms on an airport. Now, why would we want to manage for, air, for worms on an airport? Exactly. After a rain event like this, the worms get up on the runways, and gulls come in by the thousands to feed on the worms. The gulls are actually the problem with the aircraft, but the reason that they're there is because of worms. So we're, we're trying to come up with, I mean, not me, they're trying to come up with ways to, to reduce worm populations, or at least keep worms from getting on the runway areas um, that, that could you know, get into the, the flight path of these airplanes. So, what we're going to talk today about is wildlife damage in your backyard, whether it's in your garden, whether it's on your lawn, um, those kind of things. But the first question that you have to ask yourself is how much damage are you willing to accept? Are you, are you this one down here? That, you know, if they take one blueberry off your blueberry bush, that's too much, something has to happen. Um, or can you withstand a, a little bit of sharing with the wildlife um, and a little bit of damage and, you know, a couple of groundhogs in the yard? Um, or do you want nothing? And, and that's up to you to decide. That's, you know, we can't really help you with that. But once you decide that, then we can work on strategies, hopefully, uh, to help you manage some of those problems. So we sort of look at it as a stepwise process. And the first step is to identify what's causing the problem. Okay? If you have a problem with deer, it probably won't do you much good to set up um, to try to manage for groundhogs, although they may be there too. But you know, you've got to manage what the problem is. And so the first thing you need to do is identify what that is. Second thing is, once you identify what the animal is, it's time to get out and do some research and find out what you can do to alleviate the problem. Uh, and then after that, you apply what you've learned. You put the management in place. And then afterwards, you evaluate whether it was successful or not. And whether your success at the end of the day is you know, a basket of fruit or whether it's just the satisfaction of, of getting through without losing your garden, that's up to you to decide. So the first step is you identify the animal causing the damage. So that's pretty easy. When, when, the, when the deer's in your garden, there's really no question who's causing the problem. But um, there's other species that may be sort of less obvious and more subtle. You don't actually see the damage happening, but you find it afterwards. So in, in Maine, that could be any one of these deer, groundhogs, tur um, turkeys, red squirrels, you name it. This is just a partial pictorial of what is actually out there. So can anybody identify what kind of damage that is? <laughs> what is it? Skunk? Well, that's a good guess. Um, it's actually raccoon damage. Raccoons will grub in your yard just like skunks will. Now, this right here could, could throw you off. It could say skunk. Raccoons tend to roll back more earth, and this is relatively minor compared to what they can do, especially on a freshly sodden lawn. They can just peel it back and peel it back and get to the grubs underneath. Now skunks, when they feed, um, they tend to leave little cones in your yard. They'll be big at the top and little at the bottom. They're both after the same thing, which is grubs. Okay, what kind of damage is that? Deer. Are we sure? 100% sure? Go to the next one. It was deer. That's a good guess. A deer, when they browse, um, they, they don't have um, teeth in the front. They have teeth on the bottom, not on the top. So they tend to, uh, to break it more. The one on the right is from a rabbit. Rabbit have teeth on top and bottom, and, and they tend to cut at a clean 45 degree angle on your bushes. Um, but deer tend to destroy a little more as they clip. And they, they usually only go for the, the fresh growth on the end of a bush or, or a tree. Okay, so once we've identified what the animal is, now we're going to go out and we're going to look for, for resources or we're going to look for things we can do to try to manage this. 
Um, the internet is a fantastic source of information. Um, like with anything else you find on the internet, you have to be very careful about what you believe and what you don't believe. And if you need independent you know, corroboration of some of the things you read on the internet, there's other sources like us, of course. Um, the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife is an outstanding resource. Um, there's also um, an independent group of anim animal damage control agents that the state licenses and they can provide you information about these private folks that can come out to your house. Um, some of them charge a fee, some of them don't, most of them do, um, and, and help you identify and work through problems. Um, so pick up the phone, look on your computer, uh, just be very careful about what kind of things you take away from that experience because um, a lot of people are trying to sell things that may work and they may not work, and you don't want to put a whole lot of money into things that have been shown not to be effective. So find out uh, maybe some, some products that you want to try and then give somebody a call that might have some experience with them like us or IFNW or some of these ADC agents. So once we've identified what methods we use, what we like to do is take an integrated approach, which means we don't just shoot, we don't just put up um, uh, frightening devices, or we don't just shoot frightening devices, we don't just put up a fence. Um, we try to incorporate all of those things, either in series, one after another, or in combination, or alternate them. So what might work today, we'll remove and then put it up again a week from now and try something else in the meantime. You'll hear things like um, putting hair around your garden is effective. It probably is for the first day or a couple of days. You know, so if, if that's all the, the length you're looking to get out of, of your, of your uh, management, then that's okay. You know, hair will work just great. Um, but if you're looking for more long-term solutions, you want to do some other things besides just that. Um, and there's a lot of homeopathic type things that, that you can find on the internet, and some of them work and some of them don't. Um, but the key is to use things in combination. Um, for, for game species, hunting is, is an important part of management because not only does it remove certain offending birds, but it also maintains sort of the... Um, the fear of humans, which is critical to keep them out of our gardens. Um, mylar tape, mylar ribbon, is one of the best things that you can use. Um, it's cheap. A roll like this is about $2.50, and a roll like this is about $5. And I think there's you know, a couple hundred feet in here. And so when you roll this out, and I'll just go ahead and show you how this looks, Um, there's several places that you can find them. Um, on the internet is, is a good spot. Uh, Reed Joseph is a good one. Um, Sutton Agriculture. There's a lot of places um, that, that we use uh, because they're all good. And it's the same product, more or less, regardless of who's selling it. And so when you apply your mylar, you want to take the, the little cardboard out of the center and you want to pull it from the inside because as you pull it, it automatically unrolls like this, okay? So what we'll do is this will be snug, but not super tight. And when the wind blows, it does this. And it, and it looks like something that's impenetrable. I mean, it looks like I can't get through there. Um, and, and so this is fantastic stuff. It's cheap, nothing gets hurt, um, and we use Mylar quite a bit, and we recommend it a lot too, because it is, can be very effective. A lot of different species. I used it in my garden last year to keep turkeys from uh, picking my blueberries. And you know, I have, a, I have a, a wonderful yellow lab named Moose. And uh, Moose is a sweet dog, but he's not very smart. And one day, I walked by our, our window that looks out in the front yard, and there were about a half a dozen turkeys on, on my blueberries, just eating the berries off. And Moose was laying in the front yard asleep, <laughs> just like this, you know, soaking up the sun. So I opened the door, and of course the turkey started running. And Moose kind of looked at me, you know, he looked at the turkeys, he laid his head back down. You know, he wasn't too interested in helping. So, you know, I went to the, the cupboard and got some mylar, strung up a couple of strings of it, and we never had another problem. Um, you can use it in other ways, too. Um, you can put it in, in streamers, uh, and that, you know, varies in effectiveness. Sometimes people complain of gulls picking at the, uh, the shingles on their roof. Mylar is good for that. You can string it across your roof. You can put streamers up. Um, 
it's it's a really really good tool. Um, somebody mentioned geese. Was it you that mentioned geese? You can, <coughs> you can string this up two different heights, one down here maybe, and another one up around here. String it across your property between the water and your lawn, and keep the geese out. It's it's a it's a very effective tool, and, and it's like I say, it's inexpensive, um, and it's very effective. Fencing is another thing that that we encourage folks to use. Um, these split rail fences are beautiful, but you know, it's not going to keep much out. If you want to go to the extreme, you know, like the uh, electric fence on the other side can keep just about everything out. And, and this is an example of an electro net, which is a net fence. The, the mesh is, I think this is six inch mesh. Okay, and all of these are electrified. Okay, so for things like groundhogs, excuse me, and raccoons, things like that that might get in your garden, this is very effective because once they get exposed to it, um, it really does alter their behavior. Um, for deer, and somebody mentioned deer earlier, what we recommend is a single strand of electric fence with some peanut butter put on aluminum foil. So you wrap the peanut butter and aluminum foil around the single strand of electric fence, and as the deer approaches that, they get a zap, and usually they'll go away. Um, in Maine, we're, we're sort of fortunate in most areas that there's not a lot of deer, so that the pressure's not constant. Um, you know, there might be a few deer that, that utilize your property, but there's not hundreds of deer in general. Sometimes when you get into a yarding situation, that's a little more difficult. But um, typically, a few deer, give them a little zap, and, and the problem goes away. Now, with with all fence, you have to be sure that it's maintained. Because if you have, let's say, a battery-powered energizer for your electric fence and your batteries run out, well, now it's not even an obstacle. You know, they can go, go right through it. Um, so you have to be sure that you maintain it, um, not only electric fence, but also um, mylar, um, other types of fences. If tree branches fall across it, for example, you have to get that tree branch off and you have to get it fixed. Because the instant the, the fence goes down, you know, it's like the alert goes out and everybody knows about it and, you know, it's feeding time. So um, just be sure that you maintain, whether it's electric fence or anything else, that you uh, keep it in good working order. Okay, so after we've identified everything we're going to do, we're going to go ahead and implement it. And sort of in our plan, whether it's written or just in our head, we're going to know sort of the, the sequence and the series of what we're going to do. Um, and then when we're done, we look at what we did. Did we just try to pound a square hole or a square peg in a round hole? Or, or did we do what we had intended to do? And, and again, that's up to each individual to decide what is their particular success. So hopefully success will be you know, a nice bounty, bounty at the end of the, the gardening season. Um, but you know, I think that the, the take home message hopefully is that where we live, we will be exposed to a variety of wildlife. And um, we have to decide how much is too much. And if, you know, if we share a few green peppers with the deer, is that OK? Probably is. But that's up to each individual to decide. Uh, but if it gets to be more than, than you're comfortable with, there's a lot of resources out there that, that you can use that will help you solve your problems. So um, I would encourage you to give us a call. We had some, some uh, refrigerator magnet calendars over there. I hope everybody can take one home. Uh, if you have a problem, you can give us a call. You don't have to necessarily speak with me if I'm not in. Any one of our biologists would be happy to help you. Uh, we have about 18 people that are spread throughout the state, uh, so we can respond to a variety of different issues. Okay, well, good. Well, I, I appreciate everybody coming out. It's just not a great day out there, but uh, I guess that the rain will help your gardens. So uh, if we can ever help, please give us a call. And, then, and if not, I'm sure there's a lot of other folks out there that would be willing to help you. Okay? Thank you. Okay? Thank you.